because what's biological farming? What's biological agriculture? A third way. And I talk about the third way because like it's between current farming, industrial farming and organic farming. So biological farming, a third way, is that feasible? And you heard like in the talk before from Kay how difficult the organic farming was that she was doing just completely. Uh, the culture of organic farming has been don't apply fertilizer, don't apply chemicals, don't do this, don't do that. And that's farming by neglect. So we don't get necessarily better food with that. But now the modern organic farmers, and there are many in Australia, they're absolutely amazing. And with their modern organic farming style, they get higher yields than the neighbors. But not everybody can do that. They need biosensitivity. And those of you that were at my talk this morning have already heard about biosensitivity. And today I come back to that. So, of course, we are talking about uh, the biological agriculture. And I'm an agricultural scientist. I've been 40 years in this field of learning of the biology, in, of the agriculture, the science in agriculture, of the soils, the plants, the water, etc. And during my career, always working with farmers, because that's where the action is, I was always talking with the farmer because they have the practical knowledge and I had theoretical knowledge. So I could apply my theoretical knowledge to problems that they could see in their system, that we could see together in their system and improve. So it's all about the observation and the interaction, the permaculture principle that we see here, and then the integration rather than the segregation, the th pulling things apart. So that's the focus of the good farming. And we all have seen these pictures of, of planet Earth with all the big cities, all the people living there. They take all the good soils of planet Earth away for housing. And then all the landfills, lots of air pollution and cutting the forests to make room for cities and room for other activities like palm oil. And planet Earth is burning now. Planet Earth is burning. So how can we stop planet Earth burning? The landscape looks like this, like pictures from Australian landscape with dead trees, the dryland salinity, with dust storms and erosion gullies. So wind erosion, water erosion, the soil degradation is enormous. It can't be stopped in, with our current farming. And then we have the food problems. Like on, on the left hand side, agricultural science has worked with chemicals and to kill insects and to kill diseases that attack our crops. And we apply fertilizers in big amounts. And then we have feedlots where we keep the animals healthy with uh, antibiotics and feed them hormones to grow better, faster. And then we, the food that comes off the farm goes through the food processing system. And they add the food colorings and the preservatives. And that's then the fast food. And then like the hospitals do overtime and they get, become more busy all the time because our food is so bad. And like one billion people on planet Earth have too much food on the top right hand corner and one billion people on planet Earth have not enough food on the bottom left right corner. So planet Earth can produce enough food with biological farming to feed nine billion people. Because the, nine, the one billion people throw 30% of their food away as well. So it's, we don't, we have to get respect of food again. Our, our Western world, our Western thinking, our modern thinking have lost the respect of food. We need to get that back. So nutrition of food and feed, like chemicals in the food system cause harm. So in the production, using chemicals, in the storage, when the produce comes off the farm, chemicals are used, and then in the processing, chemicals are used. All those chemicals cause harm. Because synthetics, synthetic chemicals are poison or they are confusing in our body. Our, they, some chemicals are immediately excreted from our body if our body is healthy. But other chemicals, the body thinks it's good, but it, it's accumulating in the, in the body and it creates problems like with, with uh, allergies, etc. And like that's the, that's the all, all the chronic diseases, like a statement now, all the chronic diseases go back to synthetics in our body. Because those synthetics are stored in cells in our body. And those cells are then inflamed. And there's continuous inflammation, that's a chronic disease. So depending on what's, which body those cells are, is the chronic disease that you have symptoms of. And so the, what Kate was saying as well, like the, the farm gate mineral density is down by 30 to 80 percent in the last 50 years. So we have to eat the good food and we have to get to farms to get as much mineral density in the food 
to have good food. And then of course, if that food goes to the food processing, food processing, any food processing, like if you do refining, so you make white flour, white rice, white sugar, white salt, that's all bad stuff, as is the other white stuff, like heroin. So keep away from the white stuff. Because you need any color in food means minerals in that food. And then if you have food processing, like, like all, the, all the breakfast cereals, they go to the factory, they make a nice porridge, they cook the grains and they make a nice porridge, and then they use a pressure machine to make all those nice shapes. Oh, and they add 30% sugars to have it taste good. And whenever you, use, whenever you cook food and you use pressure in food, you lock up minerals. So on the package of the breakfast cereal, can say, oh, this has calcium in it and has this and that in it. All those good minerals. And we have added folate. They have added that to the breakfast cereal, but it goes in our body and out of our body because the, the energies are not in our body to extract those minerals from the processed food. <coughs> the only minerals that are easy to help of our body are minerals that are embedded in food by the growing plant, the growing animal. As soon as we cook it, we destroy, as soon as we lose the microwave, throw the microwave out of your kitchen, because the microwave destroys all the antioxidants, all the flavonoids, locks up minerals, wrong stuff. So soils keep degrading. In that whole system of food production, our soils keep degrading. So problems with our industrial agriculture, worldwide in modern farming, we need more and more fertilizers and chemicals to achieve the same yield and with a lower quality. And like in India, where I was last three years ago, there are villages there that became completely organic farming. And they said, we had to use every year more chemicals and more fertilizers to get the same yield as 30 years ago at the start of the Green Revolution. And our soil became concrete. And we didn't have the money to buy more horsepower to till our soils. And we went back to the organic farming. And now our soils are alive again, very crumbly. And our food is so good. And our, our profits are now so good that we, get, we are very happy and healthy. And we don't have chemicals around the farm. So the Green Revolution is stalling. And like the Green Revolution that started like in the early 60s with the big new varieties that needed more fertilizers and to get higher yields. But as they used more fertilizers, the plants became more susceptible for insects because the plants were unbalanced. Because as soon as you grow a plant with a fertilizer from the bag, like that you can buy in the shop, then the plant takes up that fertilizer easily because it's water soluble. And the plant takes up so much of the stuff that it doesn't take up all the other minerals required for strong cell wall build building. So the plant becomes weak. It looks good, looks nice and green and lush, but the plant is weak. And then when an insect comes, an insect can eat that plant. An insect can't eat a healthy plant because the molecules are too big. They can't digest it. In a plant fed with fertilizers that we buy in the shop, it's easy digestible, so they eat it. So the decreasing activity of soil microbes in the soil leads to the increasing dependency on synthetic inputs. So it's the microbes in the soil that have been killed during our modern farming by the big amounts of fertilizers that are very salty and dehydrating the soil around so the microbes can't survive and all the chemicals that kill microbes. So, and it's always the question like, how do we feed the world while protecting the environment and solving climate change? And all the different experts in the field, they give the governments different stories. But of course, for permaculture, we look at the whole picture in the one go. And then in agricultural science, we talk about sustainability, healthy soils, carbon farming. And all, how can that solve practical problems in the field? Because talking, talking, talking doesn't solve it. We have to do something in the field. And how can policymakers and scientists see how they can help farmers and us consumers to make the better food? And like the better results in organic farming, in the good organic farming, so that with the modern organic farming to stimulate the soil biology and to pump carbon in the soil, and like to the biological farming that creates a healthy soil, the better results are everywhere on the internet. And I don't give detailed scientific references, but if you Google like Rodale Institute in the United States, you get very good trials where they show that the yields, the profits on the organic system is higher than the profits on the conventional system, the industrial system. The Leopold Center from Iowa State University, the same stories. 
in California, the, uh, Reginald did a strawberry re farm research where he had 13 pairs of farms, one, 13 pairs of best management practice, current farming, best management practice, organic farming. And he went through all those produce from the 13 farms and they came out with big statements about antioxidant levels of the strawberries and the vitamins and minerals, etc., as good healthy strawberries from the organic farm. And like the organic center, an Amer the American organic center on the web has lots of uh, reviews on their internet system, which show like, for instance, this one, the review about nutrial, nutritional superiority and pesticide risk gives lots of examples of how good good management organic farming is. And then when you hear in your news that, that people say, ah, organic farming is not better, then you can remember what Kay was saying, like the way Kay was farming organic, that those crops had a low mineral density because they were not activated by the soil biology. So there's, it's again, organic, organic. And this morning, those people that heard me saying like, compost is not compost, biochar is not biochar. It's all very specific on how you, what methodology you use to produce produce in that name, under that name. And of course, Rudolf Steiner with the biodynamic agriculture. And in Japan, Fukuoka, like the, la the one straw revolution. Who has read Fukuoka? Yeah, great, yeah. So you know all that story. And like that's a guy with a very high biosensitivity. He could, as he walked through his paddocks, he could sense the biology, he could sense the animals, he could sense the plants. And he was completely happy. And he did no digging farming. He didn't have to do anything. He just sowed the seeds. And his energies, interaction with the plants, made that farm look superior. And all the, all the people that came to that farm, like lots of backpackers came to that farm and stayed in the hut and helped on the farm working. And there were big teaching programs in Japan and in Thailand in the rice systems. Of all those trainees, only 10% managed to get Fukuoka's outputs. Why? Because the biosensitivity of those practitioners was not high enough to grab that life on planet Earth, the, the sensing, the tuning in with nature. And that's what we again have to develop, the sensing in with nature. It's the biggest missing link even in the whole permaculture Yeah, movement, yeah, right? yeah. We haven't grown up. So that's, that's the critical part. And of course, Rudolf Steiner had that in all his lectures, that was the foundation. And then of course, Rudolf Steiner then talks about the spirituality of the farming. And with all the solar system, the moon, everything comes in place. And like that's not, and that, that uh, spirituality is not like a religion, because it's the spirit of nature that's speaking. And all the religions on planet Earth, they've taken like that spirit of nature and made their own God and their own God images with that spirit of nature. And that's the issue of us humankind, that we have to distance ourselves and get closer to the spirit of nature to see it, what it does for the plants and the animals. And of course, everybody has seen the Horse Whisperer, the movie, that lots of people can talk with horses as well. And then the FAO in 2006 had a big report about organic agriculture, food security, and they proved like the 25% of farmers of the world in India, those that are still organic, they can be very high productive systems if we improve their indigenous knowledge to what we know we can achieve with organic farming, with all the outside information. So that's the background picture that we... So at the United Nations level, everybody says, all the scientists say, we can do it. But at government levels, it's still denied. Each of our governments are, is, are beholden to the powers of the fertilizer company, the chemical company, the pharmaceutical company, and we can't get in. And then we now work at the grassroots, like permaculture is on, on the grassroots, and at that grassroots level, we can work with all that, and then the United Nations is saying that, and one day we can make connection and governments will change. So, so here we have the organic system, so we have, it's a complex, dynamic, self-organizing system. Like it's all the same as our human body used to be. Self-organizing, self-healing. But then we started to interfere with what we eat and what we are not allowed to eat or what's so-called bad for us. And our body doesn't, can, cannot heal itself anymore. And like the same with the field outside, the gardens, that with all those microbes in the soil, the, plant, the soil was self-healing. It was like there were 15,000 species of microbes in the soil and each and some of the and of course with those 50,000 species like lots of them had the same task but then you have a different species for a different temperature different moisture content different time of the year different plants growing so each time like for every one function 
there are like 15 different species that can do that function. So there's never in, in our an ecosystem, climate system cycle, there's never a hole in that system that's not covered by a microbe. But as we start killing those microbes with lots of fertilizers and chemicals, then we get holes in the system and we get problems. And then the soil starts to degrade because it can't heal itself anymore. Because the soil is living. And it's the biological microbes in the soil food web that are the key part of that system. The same as the key part in our stomach. So that, so yeah, those, so the first, uh, the first ten principles of uh, permaculture I had at the top, the top two levels, like that self-healing system and the soil, all the organisms that work in it. And then we have to manage it. We have to manage the balance and diversity. And that's of course done with the bottom two uh, principles to be observant and to interact and to then be creative with change. Because life is always changing, biology is always changing. The, the patterns of our climate are always changing. So we have to observe and then be creative in how we respond to changes and not do the same thing all the time. Because planet Earth doesn't work with the same thing all the time. And then, and then as we do the inputs, Inputs have to be small amounts and we have to avoid synthetics. And we have to do small amounts because any big amount, like 100 kilos, 200 kilos, a ton per hectare for lime and things like that, those big amounts completely upset the fine balance set by the microbes. And like the science world always talks like in 100 kilos per hectare, etc. And they get big results. But like if, you, if the plant needs like 5 kilos per hectare as something good, we can't balance all those little changes. So we give the big bang and it works. And that's of course the principle of uh, the snail, where the snail is the, stands for a slow change and not a big change as in our current industrial farming. It needs to be slow with, sm with small amounts. So biological agriculture, a third way. So here we have the current industrial farming system and we put lots of chemicals and fertilizer in. And like I said before, over the, whole, over the whole world, also in the United States, in the Midwest, in Europe, Australia, India, China, <coughs> all the rice in Southeast Asia, they have to use more and more fertilizers every year to get the same yield. And in Southeast Asia, the yields are going down. So the industrial farming doesn't work. So then people say, oh, become organic, stop using synthetics, stop using fertilizers, work with nature. But organic farming doesn't work. The step is too big. Because in the first two years, you, the whole system is adjusting. And if your soil is degraded, then you can't passively improve the soil. And organic farming is like passive. So what you have to do is you have to stimulate the soil to balance the soil and slowly go to, towards organic. And we do that with biological farming. So with biological farming, we take the best from the current farming systems and we take the best from, from organic. And that's the, the, the goal that we have. And then we go step by step, season after season, in that direction. And we lower the fertilizer use and we lower the chemical use as we go. And like my recommendation is in the first year, you use like 80% of the fertilizers and no fungicides and no insecticides. 80% of the fertilizer and 20% of the money that you save, you use for agriculture, for biological stimulants. Like for a compost tea, for, to look at uh, calcium availability uh, in the compost, etc to stimulate that soil biology, to resurrect the soil biology, to activate the soil biology, so that you can go a step forward. And in all my experiences, from the feedback of farmers, that first step, they always go the second step. Because in that first step, they break even. They get the same money out of the 20% biological as about the industrial, and sometimes more. But they also see the improvement of the soil. The soil becomes more crumbly, better infiltration. And because they see the soil improving, they take the next step and go again down another 20% fertilizer. And right in the first year, that's the absolutely amazing, like with canola, the, 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 the Canadian bread rapeseed for uh, canola oil, everybody knows. Like with canola, the first year, the first activity on a farm with biological farming, you inoculate the canola seed with uh, compost tea or with worm juice, with biological activity, a biological liquid. So you, you inoculate that seed and then you sow the seed and you don't put an insecticide on that seed. And then 
the red-legged earth mites that always come to canola and eat the seedling, the red-legged earth mites don't show, they don't come. So right from the first moment, by inoculating the seed, you make a neutral zone, a, a positive zone that keeps the pathogens away. And that's always the eye-opener for farmers that start that process. And in your own garden you can start doing that as well, to inoculate seed and to put uh, the biology close to the seed so that the seedling becomes strong straight away. And of course, in that process we need bio biosensitivity. Like I said before, like on the, on the right hand side, like in that organic circle, only those farms that are biosensitive can be productive, can be making money and can buy another farm. And like in Victoria, there's one dairy farmer that works as a biosensitive organic dairy farmer and he buys a new dairy property every third year. He's flying and his, his properties look amazing, very biodiverse and healthy and he gets very good quality organic milk. But other organic farmers that tried went bust because they couldn't get the quality of the milk up because their passes were not up to scratch. So biosensitivity very important. And then of course as we go from the left to the right we build the landscape. We make the landscape functioning as ecosystems. We get all the biodiversity back in the landscape and because we get the biodiversity back in the landscape with all the birds and the bees we get the predators back that take the bad insects from our plants and we don't have to use insecticides whenever they appear. This is the important thing with soil management. Like here we have the farming systems of the industrial agriculture and the biological organic agriculture system. The industrial farming is maximizing output through inputs. That's why we call it industrial farming, input output. So the more you can input do the input, the more output you get, but if you don't get rain, you get lower output. So in rain, in rain fed farming and in irrigation farming, depending on how much water you have, you have to assess how much rain you expect to direct the inputs to the plants. In biological organic farming, it's to maximize the soil health, so to, to maximize the active, activity of the biology in the soil and to have carbon in the soil, etc. So if we then look at who is feeding oh, the wrong, wrong button. Who is feeding and protecting the growing plants? Who is doing that? Well, in our industrial system, it's us people that do it. We feed the plant with nitrogen fertilizer, the plant bursts out with a growth spurt, it becomes weak because it doesn't have all the other minerals to make strong cell walls, so the insects come, insects eat the plant, so then we come with a spray pack and we kill the insects. So we are, the we do we are doing the feeding and the protecting of plants. In the biological system, it's the soil organisms that feed the plant and the soil organisms that protect the plant. So with those 15,000 species, some of them are f making enzymes that make minerals soluble so that the plant can have the minerals. Other microbes make a root zone, glue soil to the root and make a zone around the root that's neutral and they protect the root against the pathogens that want to eat the plant. Like the root-eating nematode can't reach a root in a healthy soil because the root-eating nematode can't bite through the layer of protection. All the other organisms keep the root-eating nematode out. So that's the principle of biological farming, that you create that soil organism that does all the work for you. They feed the plant with the minerals that the plant needs and they protect the plant against pathogens. Because pathogens, I make that, when the power goes out you can ask me a question about pathogens. So biological inputs, of course composting is the most important part and like the no waste and the, the resources, the renewable resources, valuing, valuing resources is very important in the biological inputs and composting is the foundation of those issues to recycle and make fertility. But like on the market, there are now various products available, you can, you, you can have biological stimulants. And like a biological stimulant is a, a, a biological product that stimulates all the life in the soil that's already there. And like the biodynamic principles, like biodynamic preparations are a product that does stimulate the local biology. And then you have like seaweeds, uh, humates, fulvic acid, humic acids, molasses, fish proteins, they all are, they stimulate the soil biology. So you can use that to stimulate the soil biology if you know you have a good population. But if you don't have a good population, you can kickstart that whole biological field by biologi with biological inoculants. So you can apply compost, but like on a broad acre farm you can't apply compost. And like my talk is like about broad acre farming. Why 
in that, process, in that system from current farming to bio organic farming, you do the biological farming, because on the broad acre, you can't afford to go bang from current to organic. You can lose too much money. But like in a home garden, you can easily make that step, because you don't, it's not profitable. It, there's no profit involved, no dependency. So for, for, the broad, for, the, so for home gardens and for orchards, you use compost, but for broad acre, you extract a liquid from the compost, so you put the compost in water, like five kilos of compost in 100 gallons of water, and then you circulate that, and you then extract the liquid, and that's a tea that you then spray out on the broad acre. Or there's another way you can brew for 24 hours as well, but that's a question that you can ask later. And then of course we have liquid brews that, uh, liquid brews that you can make, like there are companies in the world that make that, that sell that brew, and then FEM, the mycorrhiza, like in the mycorrhiza is the most critical fungi in the soil because it attaches itself to the root. It attaches itself to the root and it communicates with the root on what the, what the plant needs and what the plant gets. And that's the, that's the fam. And in Australia you can buy it in a bottle, fr freeze dried, and you can add that to your inoculant and as a quick start. And then of course the worm juices, the vermiculture, very powerful stuff to apply. And then depending on the feedstock of the worm farm, you can create a better worm juice, like you can add uh, seaweed to your feedstock of the, the worm farm, so then all the micronutrients from the seaweed become biologically available in the worm cast or in the worm juice. And also some lime, because then that calcium becomes biologically available easily. So all these things we can play with, with worms. And of course this morning we heard from uh, Albert, that you can do, put, do, do it also with uh, the biochar, that fine powdered biochar, the worms eat it as well, and that can give an additional benefit. And then we have mineral fertilizers. And like mineral fertilizers are the unprocessed minerals that the plants need. So it's soft, soft rock phosphate, lime, gypsum, crushed rock minerals, like basalt rocks the, from the last volcanoes, etc. That basalt has a very high mineral content. So if you crush it, to a very fine powder and like lime as well, the finer you make those minerals in powder, the more surface area each prill has because then you, you broadcast that on the paddock and then the microbes colonize each particle of the mineral and start dissolving it, making it soluble and give it to the plant. So if you put big rocks on the paddock, that's nothing happens because it, it's too slow to take up by to decompose, to make soluble by the microbes, because the surface area is not big enough. And also, like, in the, in the industrial farming, like in Australia, the governments are saying, ah, oh, stupid to put rock phosphate on your paddock, because plants can't take it up. Of course, that's true. Plants can't take up rock phosphate. So what you have to do is you have to make the biology active, that you get active biology that can make the phosphorus soluble and give it to the plant. And that's the power of biological farming. There's no single factor, it's all a system. And then of course, like in, in this story, you can ask, oh, what about a chemical, what, what about uh, the other fertilizers? Like the NPK, the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, those are chemical fertilizers. Like mineral fertilizer is the pure mineral, chemical fertilizer is that mineral goes to the factory, like phosphorus, the phosphate rock goes to the factory, then they use a process of acidification to make that phosphorus water soluble and then they put it in sand and in a bag and sell it to the farmer for a good profit. And then you have to top broadcast the fertilizer. The fertilizer hits the ground. And then the water soluble phosphorus, a plant has to grow actively. And like for two, two months, six weeks, two months, that phosphorus can be taken up by plants. But then the rest of the phosphorus is then locked up on, like if you have lots of calcium in the soil, in alkaline soil, the phosphorus is locked up with calcium and no longer available to the plant. But then if we have activated the biology, then the biology can again unlock that phosphorus from the calcium and give it to the plant. All these miracles exist and are, are quantified. And then of course we have biological fertilizers, like the worm juice, worm cast, fish protein, seaweed, compost, compostee, compost of the manure. They are all fer uh, fertilizers, biological fertilizers. And like I say in that list, like composted manure, because manure, the pure manure by itself is not a good fertilizer for plants. Because the pure manures, the chicken litter and the cow manure, etc., that has 
water-soluble nitrogen phosphorus potassium in it. So if you put a pure manure on the paddock then, or in your garden, then the plants immediately start to grow. And because it's water-soluble NMP and K, the plants grow too fast so it doesn't pick up the other minerals, so you get weak plants. If you compost that manure, then all those minerals are embedded in the compost, in the soil particles that are made in the humus and the, the organic carbon that's made, and then you get slow release. And that slow release is only facilitated by the active microbes in the field. So it's that system that's very good. And like with the, the chicken litter, we have a very good system with a chicken litter that, like if you have a chicken uh, farm nearby, then you can take chicken litter, and then, like yesterday, we heard about uh, effective microbes, the EM, and then you can use like EM in dissolved in water, and you wet the chicken litter to 50% moisture, and that's like, uh, what was the Costa Rican name? Dye. Yeah, Dye. Dye. He's not here? Oh, you can't hear the story. Yeah, so then, uh, yeah, those, those of you that didn't see it, like to get, to get uh, compost in the right moisture content, you wet the chicken litter and like mixed with the EM and then you make a ball, you squeeze a ball of the chicken litter and when you, op when you open it, when you have wet hands, then there's too much moisture. And when you open it and it falls apart, there's not enough moisture and your hands are dry. So that's the 50% rule with like anything we make in, in uh, chicken litter, any kind of uniform mixture. Because it, like, it, you can only do that with a uniform mixture like chicken litter because as soon as there are other bigger parts, smaller parts in, in a mixture, it's difficult to make a ball. So that's the chicken litter. And then you make like... Uh, gee, what's the English name? A, a, a wedge, a row, a hedge, a hedge row? A windrow, yeah. Gee, my mind was escaped. Yeah, you make a windrow like of this height, and then you smear the outsides of that windrow, and then within two days, the temperature goes up. With inside that, if you have the right temperature, the, 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 temperature go, the right moisture content, the temperature goes up. And then after six weeks, you can turn the heap, and then inside it's all pure soil. The outside can still have a cake. But in that way, you can make in, in eight weeks a very good soil, and you broadcast that on the paddock. And I've done that with farmer groups in Australia, like with a group of 16 farmers, and they all had the same recipe. We had meetings talking about it, like I talk about here. And then two of, and the same, the same contractor dis distributed, broadcasted the, the chicken litter over the paddocks, because it was in, in like one district, and they, they all got it from the same chicken farm. And two had a perfect compost, absolutely amazing. It smelled good, sweet, and nice crumbs, and perfect. And two hadn't worked at all. So they didn't check the temperature after two days, three days, and no, nothing happened. And then the whole gradation in between. The second year, half of the people had the good compost. Because everything we do, don't give up if it fails. Try again. Talk with others. Because we are on a new road of learning and things that the other people haven't done. So then you are allowed to fail. Because it's not failing, it's learning. It's only if you do it for the second time, you're stupid. Uh, <laughs> But we can make all those jokes, but it's, uh, it's learning, and we have to communicate with each other. If you don't have access to seaweed, um, like if you're in a prairie or something, can you use uh, lake plants? Will it give you a similar response as far as uh, food stimulants? Which plants? Uh, like lake plants, like freshwater plants. Uh, oh. aquatic plants. No, the, the mineral density of those is not, not as high. Because it's, it's the mineral density of the, the seaweeds and like the 60 different mineral trace elements that are in, is in there. Seawater. Yeah, and, and the seawater as well. Like those of you that... Oh yeah, here is a bit far away. Oh, Akaba is not that far. Like, yeah, because there are, there are like across, uh, along the Australian coast there are farmers that go to the coast and take uh, seaweed themselves. And that has absolutely magic power. And also you, hear, you read stories like in Acres USA about using seawater, just spreading seawater on the land and you get an amazing result. Yeah, 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 and it's only once in a while that you have to do it, like once a year or just at the start of, of a, a spring. Question? Well, just partly in response to that, to that, I'd say that coastal agriculture is one of the least de developed parts of what we should need to be doing because uh, there's huge potential to have a very productive coastline. Yeah. Um, 
Did you put exhaust fumes in to test whether we were awake? Exhaust fumes. Under bio inputs. Yeah. You had exhaust fumes. Yeah, exhaust fumes. Yeah. Yeah, that's a developed from a, from a farmer in Canada who started to put his exhaust uh, into his sewing rig with tubes to blow the exhaust fumes into the sewing uh, tines to activate, to, uh, to see what happened. And like in the diesel, because in the diesel is sulfur, in the diesel is lots of elements, a carbon and things like that. And that's, that works as a stimulant for the biology. So the biology is stimulated by that exhaust fume and they multiply in numbers and they, they stimulate that seedling. So he got better yields. What? what else came out with the fumes earlier? What else? Uh, well, CO2. And CO2 is a plant stimulant as well. The plants grow better with more CO2. Interesting. And now... Yeah, now some, some unburned fuel will also come in, no? Is that, does that cause any kind of harm? Or? Well, he said... Yeah, that's, that's a good point because he said something he had to do something with the engine to put a converter in or... Yeah, some, there's something with the engine, you have to put the converter, some, something. <coughs> yeah, I'm, not, I'm, not an, I'm not a mechanic, so I don't know anything about it. And when I hear those things, that's part of the things I put out of my mind because I have enough to remember. Was it biodiesel, maybe? maybe no, no, it was not biodiesel. No, it was, it was the pure diesel. Yeah, so we still, the light is flashing. It's, it will come on again. Oh, it's the battery, of course. So, any question? I said, ask me in the in the break about what was the question. I said that I would talk about in the pathogens, pathogens, yeah, pathogens. Yeah, that's the amazing thing of planet Earth. And like in our households, we all about oh, you have to kill the germs and you have to kill germs and all that stuff. And like in my household, like always using natural soap. And then at one point, my 16-year-old started to have red rashes on his body. So I started to analyze the things in the house. And I came to the point of the liquid soap that was introduced in the household. Like liquid soap that kills 99.9% .9 of the bacteria. So if, if I have just washed my hands with natural soap and I count the bacteria on one square centimeter of my hand palm, I have one million bacteria on my hand. Because they are the, the natural protectors of our body. If you use that germ killing soap, then it kills some of those beneficial bacteria that, that protect our body. And then, like my son got red rashes, so we got we kicked the liquid soap out, and he was healed, and he became a believer straight away, because he saw it in his own body. So he's now very conscious about how he lives and all the synthetics. And so then, okay, so we are on the pathogens, and like in nature, like of the of the of the hundred pathogens in nature, five percent, five of the hundred are pathogens. So of the 100 microbes in nature, 5 are pathogens, 95 are beneficials. That those know, you know, know all, the, all, the, all the microbes in the world. If we have all the microbes in the world, in that category, of the 100%, 5% are pathogens, 95% are beneficials. <coughs> and those beneficials all work together to protect our body, because our body feeds them and they keep the germs away because the germs kill us and then they don't have food anymore. And in the soil, those beneficials protect the plant because the plant feeds them. The plant leaks sugars into the soil that feed the beneficial organisms. Like pathogens can't drink sugar, can't eat sugar from a plant. Pathogens have to take, have to eat, have to bite from a plant because the plant doesn't, they can't drink sugar. Liquid exudates. So that's a pathogen. It grabs things. So then the beneficial organisms protect the plant in the roots. They, they glue like root soil around the root to make a core, the rhizosphere as we call it, the sphere around the root, that the, the pathogens can't reach the root. On the leaves, the beneficials make a film over the leaf that the pathogen can't puncture a hole and reach the veins. So that's what beneficials do. So now in our modern farming, we have killed so many of those species that there are big holes in the system, and then the pathogens have free reign, and they attack our plants, and then we kill them with a the fungicide. What, what does a fungicide do? It kills the pathogen. What, what, what else does it do? It kills more beneficials. 
So we have been on that roller coaster for five, five decades and we kill more and more of those beneficials. That's why farmers have to use more and more fertilizers and chemicals in farming. Because in the past, like example, rice in Southeast Asia. Like when the Green Revolution started with rice in Southeast Asia, there were still all those living organisms in the paddies. So they were feeding the plant. But then the farmers put nitrogen fertilizer on there. So then some of them were killed, but then they, re they resurrected, they re recovered by the next year again. So each time you put nitrogen fertilizer in, less and less survive. So then what the picture I showed, like who's feeding my plant, we humans have to feed the rice more and more because all the microbes in the soil are killed. So the microbes can't help feeding the plant anymore and not protecting the plant. So that's the modern farming, that's the industrial farming explained. Like the, and nature was so powerful. And when I, the first time I said that in a scientific seminar in May 2005 in Canberra to my learned colleagues in a, in a seminar about the biological farming, the way for the future. And then I said about this, that we created resistance in plants, that plants couldn't be eaten by insects and diseases. Because we create resistance. Because like the way Kay was talking about re raising the BRICS level, as soon as you raise the BRICS level of a plant, that plant can't be eaten by an insect or attacked by a disease. And that's the natural process. So at question time, at question time at that seminar, my colleagues were attacking me and saying, ah, that hasn't been proven by science that you can make plants resistant. You haven't proven that. I said, if that was not true, we humans would not be here on planet Earth. Because all those pathogens, they could have kept eating. Why did they stop? Because they came to plant that plants that they couldn't eat. And those plants made seed and they dropped that seed and in that way you created again a resistant plant that grows. Because those plants are then connected with microbes in the soil. Those microbes in the soil provide the plant with the minerals it needs to be strong, to have strong cell walls that insects can't eat and disease can't protect, in, infect. That's how the cycle of life went. Yeah, that's a question about there should not be insects because if all the plants were like that, then the insects don't have food. Well, insects are garbage collectors in nature because you can imagine all plants can't have always the protection of all the beneficial organisms in their root system. And like there are always plants in a, in a field that are sick, that, that can't get the stuff they need. And then the insects come and eat that plant. So the insects are garbage collectors of nature. That those that weak plants can't make seed and can't destroy life on earth. So here we continue now with the so that's the composting, the yeah, so the biodynamic preparations, compost and manure, the biological fertilizers. So then we get like the another studies of the United Nations agencies on food and climate. And they they concluded that low external input, sustainable agriculture is based on local knowledge systems. Like local knowledge systems, what the people in the local districts know, indigenous knowledge, and then we can improve that indigenous knowledge with the knowledge we have from other areas. And like in that CSRO uh, seminar that I gave, some people then said, oh, we don't, we, we don't want to go back to the dark ages. I said, we don't go back to the dark ages if we don't use chemicals and fertilizers because I can help my great-grandfather who had a cropping farm and a great-grandfather who had a dairy farm, I could help them making a better system with the knowledge I have, without going to fertilizers and chemicals. And that's what we can do with indigenous systems. We can improve that with all the knowledge we have and avoid using chemicals and fertilizers. And that's now by the United Nations agreed. And like there was a big report last year, 2010, where the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the right to food said, governments and international agencies urgently need to boost agroecological farming techniques to increase food production and save the climate. So that's the whole biological farming, the agroecological farming. It's all, sometimes the, the use of names of, the, the use of words can be confusing, but like agroecological farming is like that, still it's not organic farming. Organic farming is part of agroecological farming, but like biological farming is the farming that you are allowed some synthetics if need be in small amounts. But I come to that point later. So again, this is an international study by the United Nations saying that it's good. The same as the study by the IAASTD International Assessment 
for agricultural knowledge, science, science and technology for development, reported 2008. And if you Google those and you read them, it's absolutely amazing. We don't need all those fertilizer chemicals the way our current governments still say that we have to save the earth with. And like lots of those studies go back to Professor Pretty from Essex University, who did in 2006, he had an overview of the agroecological farming. And he found 286 projects in 57 developing countries with a 79% average yield increase. So you go, he, all those projects were like indigenous knowledge. You go there with the current knowledge and you do the right planting, the right seed and the right sequence, compost making, and you increase the yields with 80%. That's what we can do on planet Earth. But of course, Bill Gates, he gives uh, Africa 35 million to make GM corn, etc., because he says we can't do it without. So that's the plain stupidity that power can buy, that money can buy. And how can we stop that? And countries that have done that, like of course, like Cuba, and we heard a lot from Ronaldo about that. And regions, in re different regions and countries have been very successful. In Malawi, Niger, we heard from Tony about that. In Brazil, in China, absolutely amazing. The Lust Plateau from John Liu. Incre incredible uh, YouTube uh, videos on that Lust Plateau project. And if you, if you see that, you can see what we humans can do. Absolutely amazing. So the biological agriculture principles. So for a healthy living soil, we have to reactivate and improve the soil biology and increase the soil organic carbon. And like that reactivation of the soil biology and the increase of carbon go hand in hand. Because it's the organisms that we activate in the soil that start making the carbon, sequestering the carbon in the soil. Because like the, the thing, the issue is like in a dead soil, in our current industrial farming in the dead soil, the plants don't leak sugars into the soil because there's nothing to feed, so they don't do it. But as soon as they're beneficial organisms in the soil that protect the plant and that feed the plant, the plant leaks sugars into the soil. And sugars is carbon. So all the leftover carbon in the soil is then immediately used by organisms to make humus, the stable carbon in the soil, a soil fertility factor. So that whole process of, of healthy soil, biological carbon, pumping carbon in the soil, put so much carbon in the soil that we increase the soil fertility and we get a very good soil that is productive. And like we do the recycling, the plant residues are recycled, so we have to get the contact of the plant residue with the soil so that the microbes in the soil can decompose that residue and put that carbon in the soil. But as soon as we have standing stubble, standing crop and plant residue in the field, that carbon will slowly oxidize and go up in the sky as CO2. It needs the contact with the soil to be able to become soil carbon. And of course with the manure, we then have like the dung beetles that roll little rolls of dung and bury it in the soil. So then the dung is uh, decomposed in the soil, all the minerals are released in the soil, in the, in the organic carbon layers, and it's the recycling process and everything becomes available for the next crop. And then we have to reduce the chemical fertilizer and use biological fertilizer and stimulants to steer productivity and resilience. Like the way I talked about in the break about the process that we, like in the first year, use 20% less fertilizers, etc., to gradually go step by step to the good farming, the good soil. Because that's the other thing, like making a healthy soil, you can't make a healthy soil in one bang in one year. Because the whole biology is in cycles. And all those organisms are cycling in different directions. So if you do it step by step, then slowly all those cycles start to become in tune with each other and you get the whole system working. And like after three, four, five years, depending on the kind of field you have and the, how degraded the soil is or how bad the soil is, how good the soil can be, you have the whole thing in, in place and it's all running. And then like you avoid fungicides and insecticides because like I said before, as soon as we use a fungicide and insecticide, it doesn't kill only the insect that we want to kill, it kills the predators as well. It doesn't kill only the pathogen that we want to kill, it kills the beneficials as well. So avoid the fungicides and insecticides. And the conditions determine the gene expression. I hope that's the only slide that is uh, 
gone different in the transportation. Ecosystems, so now we go to the ecosystems, the natural biological systems. Oh, yeah. So healthy humans, for healthy humans, healthy animals and healthy plants, we need nutrient-dense food from healthy soils. We need biodiversity, and that biodiversity is self-regulating, self-adjusting, self-healing. Uh, so the more biology we have, the higher the biodiversity, the more self-regulating that system can be. And that's again, the cycle works. And then the landscape. We get ecosystem services, we get clean water, clean air, oxygen production, good food production, and the whole system is in place. And then from memory, I don't know what the last line would have been. So this is like the soil food web. And like the soil food web is the foundation of life on planet Earth. The topsoil on our planet is the foundation of life on Earth. Without that topsoil, there could not be life on Earth because plants would not be able to grow. And what we have been doing over the last hundred years with our topsoils right around the country, around the, the globe, around planet Earth, is degrading the topsoil. And at the moment, like from the United Nations, they say 40% of our topsoils in our planet Earth are degraded. 40%. That's why we have the desertification, that the desert is incre increasing, etc. And then, of course, with the, with the examples from Tony, etc., that we can go put the deserts back with the good plant growth, stimulating the trees and getting that whole soil biology back and getting the activities of the plants to, that can, then can grow. So this whole system starts like with the green leaf and the sun. The sun gives the energy to combine the carbon dioxide from the sky with the water in the soil to make the sugars the CH&O combination. And they, those sugars then make the plants and the roots. The plants grow, make fruit, grain, etc. And then they die. And then they become organic matter. And that's done by the, the microbes. Like microbes are decomposing the organic matter. And like you have specialists in there as well, because like cellulose, the, the outer stem of plants is, is hard cellulose. And it needs another crazy critter to digest than the normal soft carbon from leaves. So if we don't have that, micro, the, the fungi, because it's a fungi that does the cellulose decomposition, if we don't have that fungi in our soils, then cellulose can stay behind because it's a very slow decomposing material. It's not as hard as carbon, but it comes close. So with the microbes, they do the first steps of the work, and then every, every next layer of living organisms, they eat the previous layer. So the bird eats the beetle, eats the mite, and eats the, the microbes, and that whole food web is intact. So we need that food web also for all the predators above the soil to be able to pick out all the insects that are around that could attack our crops, vegetables, etc. And here we have a look in the soil. So here we see a root going into the soil, and attached to the root is the mycorrhiza. So the mycorrhiza is a fungi that's attached to the root and it goes very long arms into the soil to pick up minerals and water to give to the plant. And that mycorrhiza talks with the plant. And there are now scientific papers in the international literature that start to unravel the communication between plant and the mycorrhiza. So this is no longer a furvy that I tell you. Oh, furvy is Aussie for some dreamt up story. Uh, what's the uh, any other thing? A fairy tale, yeah, yeah. So it's not. So what I'm talking about again, it's not a fairy tale. It's now all proven by science. Because the plant knows what it needs to make strong cell walls, to to grow new strong cells, because it wants to protect itself from insects and diseases. So the plant asks for all the minerals that it needs to be strong, and the mycorrhiza then communicates with all the other microbes in the soil to get all those minerals solubilized and transported to the plant with water as well, like. A plant with mycorrhiza can take up more water than a plant without. And that's, in, that's a, one advantage like of the big drought of the decade, the, yeah, the, decade the, the past decade in Australia, very dry weather, with lots of droughts, that I was going around all those farms and seeing the biology in action. And then you come to the biological properties with healthy soils, and those yields then were higher than the neighbor. Because the mycorrhiza was giving more water to the plant than the plant could extract from the soil. And of course the crumb structure, you can see here, like all these soil particles are glued together and then it makes pores, like that's the crumb structure with pore space. So when it rains, 
the water can infiltrate in the soil. When a root grows, the roots can go into the soil because there's air, there's open soil, loose soil. And it's all done by the microbes. They use glues and waxes to make those crumbs in the soil from the soil particles. And here is like a plant from a healthy soil on the left hand side and a plant from a not healthy soil on the right hand side from side by side paddocks from different properties. So the same rainfall, the same grassy system. And here on the left hand side you can see the soil glued to the root. And like if you shake that plant the soil doesn't fall off because it's, it's glued to it. This one, as soon as you lift, you take it with a shovel out of the soil and you touch the plant, all the dust falls off. There's no rhizosphere. So that plant has to suck up all the minerals from the fertilizer, the water soluble minerals. Because it doesn't have microbes that make the minerals soluble that the plant can take up. So it depends on the fertilizer for feed. And here, here we have like the important part of carbon, why carbon is important in our farming system. And like 2% like carbon is the limit. Like we need soils with more than 2% carbon. And that's like 4% organic matter, roughly. And like in the past, before our forebears started to cultivate lands, all the lands of planet Earth were at that level. 4% organic matter or better. Except of course in the sandy desert, because then you have sand. But in any oasis in the desert, you have that 4% 4, 4 organic matter at least, or not more. So then, because you can see below 2%, if we then start to cultivate crops and hay production, grass production for grazing, all the fields that have a low carbon content, you <coughs> excuse me, you got a lot of variability in the production. Because those plants become very susceptible to climatic conditions, to heats, to droughts, to frosts. So lots of, uh, lots of impact of the environment on the production. So there you go, like from two, two tons per hectare hay to 10 tons per hectare hay from below 2% to above 2% when it becomes very stable around the 8 ton per hectare hay production. And it is, the 2% carbon is associated with like a topsoil layer thickness with all the active biology and that, that topsoil like of 5 centimeters gives then the roots a head start to make a healthy plant. If you don't have that head start, the plant never gets there, it stays weak. And, it, and every hot period it falls over, a frost it falls over, drought it falls over, etc. So we need the carbon as an immune system for the soil. The higher the carbon level, the higher the immune system of the soil, the better the plants grow. And like there was a study in Australia in 1995 published by the CSRO, colleagues of mine in another group, and a bank with, with like a billion dollar mortgages in the farming world, or X billion, whatever it is, they commissioned CSRO to make a study on what is the determining factor of the price of land. Because they were worried that the price of land was going up, but what was the controlling factor? And in that study, they found that like a 1% organic carbon, like in that, in that range from like around 1%, between 0% and 2%, in that range of low carbon, there was a $170 per hectare increase in, in profits, in the gross margin of cropping and pastures, any farm activity. So $170, and that's $1995. So today it's $350, $400 on the 1% extra carbon in the soil. So because, like from the previous picture, you could see, or from this one, you can see, like the variability, when the carbon is low, it costs you money. As soon as you're at that, at that side, you stabilize the production and you get a good profit. So that's one reason. Like you don't, you don't put carbon in the soil for sequestration for carbon credits, like what the current uh, talk is, to put carbon in the soil, oh, then you get carbon credits. No, the farmer gets more profits per hectare per year by just putting the carbon in there for productivity improvement. And like when I talked about this like 10 years ago, nobody was listening. But now, when the carbon credits come in, suddenly farmers start to listen. Oh, can I make money with carbon credits? And like, this is, of course, the, the worm cast on the palm of the hand from a good compost, worm compost. And like in the biological farming, the carbon farming, we get carbon sequestration and reduced emissions. Because as you don't apply fertilizers in big amounts, you reduce the emissions. And like for the sowing operations, with the, you, you save like 50% of the diesel 
in that biological farming because the soil is more loose and you don't do that many passes. So 50% diesel is safe from industrial farming towards biological farming. And then like the soil test, like my personal experience traveling around the country in Australia, right from the dry areas to the hot, the hot tropics and the wetlands in the east coast and all climates in Australia, all states in Australia, I found farmers with 0.2 to 0.5% carbon increase per year. Absolutely amazing. When you do that biological farming. And like that's what you show what I show here, like the, the science world says, like my colleagues were saying, oh that's impossible, you can't do that. Because there are not that many plant residues to put that much carbon in the soil. But it's not the plant residues that do that. It's the exudates, like the, 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 the sugars that are leaked through the roots to feed the bugs in the soil. That's a very important component of that extra carbon. And the phototrophic bacteria. Because phototrophic bacteria are bacteria that, that live by themselves in the soil and they take carbon dioxide from the sky and put it as carbon in the soil. So it's those processes that give us the big carbon increase in the soil. And the organisms that do that are like, they, they make the humus, the earthworms, of course they make the good humus, the worm cast, but also the mycorrhiza, like the, the, the fungi that's attached to the root. And the plant feeds the sugars through that mycorrhiza and any excess carbon that the mycorrhiza gets, it makes glomalin, which is like a, a humus type big carbon chain. So that's why that system is so efficient, because it makes humus all the time. And why do those buckers make humus in the soil all the time? All those microbes and the worms. Why do they do that? Habitat. All that energy. Habitat. Exactly. They make a habitat that's so good, so fertile, that next year a new plant will grow and pump food in the soil. Because if they don't do that, if they don't improve the humus content of the soil, then the plant production stays the same as always. But they put more humus in the soil, but then, then they know we get more food next year. All organisms on planet Earth want to live. All organisms want to live. That's the power of biology. So then we go to the fields, like a paddock is a field in the Aussie language. And then on the, on the field level, in, we, we change management practices. Like for, for grazing systems, we do the cell grazing. Like anyone familiar with cell grazing principles? Yeah, with Alan Savory, etc. So it's a small, a small area with a big number of animals for a short time. So you have to subdivide your paddock in smaller parts. And of course, with the permaculture principles, you use the windbreaks, shelter belts to make nice smaller units and then have the, the grazing system rotating through those cells. Very important for biological farming. And then, of course, we have to design the landscape and we use permaculture to design the landscape. So we, we increase the biodiversity in the landscape and we woodlands, like on ridges, we make woodlands. On the low parts, we make wetlands. And then we have the windbreaks, shelter belts to sh give shelter to animals, to increase the productivity of animals. So we do all these things and all these things increase the biodiversity on the farm, in the landscape. So it's very important. And then we can use like, like a Yomas key line, like the chisel plow with the Yomas principles that follows the contour to, the, to stop the runoff of water. So all the water, when it rains, the water fall, falls into those grooves of the contour so it doesn't go down. A very important aspect of to recreate an aerated zone for roots to grow and to, in, to enhance the biological activity. And then we have the natural secrets farming, which is like Peter Andrews and Ozzy, who designed an with all the degraded gullies and like what is here. When you have an erosion gully, Peter started to make leaky weirs with, with stones and big tree trunks in such a way that, that it created a pond above the leaky weir, but there was always water trickling through. And if the flood became higher, then he had special ways that the water would go over the weir from two sides. And when water goes over the weir from two sides, like it's a V, then the water collapses from two sides and that re reduces the speed of water. So then the water slows down slowly. And I could have put in pictures of this and I can talk about it for this principle for an hour as well. That's Peter Andrews and he has a book, Nat it's Natural Seekers Farming and you can Google that on the internet and he has a book as well, there are two books about that. But it's a very important principle that as the water flows down we want to rehydrate the landscape, so we want to slow the water right from the top of the, of the catchment to slow the water down so that as much water soaks into the landscape. 
and doesn't go to the ocean. Pardon? Not quite yeah, like a swale does. Yeah. There's a, a chap in uh, Wales called uh, Chris Dixon yeah. who has a place called Tir Penros Issa, and um, he's starting to use something called fascine causeways. Yeah. Which is basically a fascine is a bundle of sticks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can create causeways which are these long bundles of sticks, but you know along the contour more yeah. or less. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, they're just fairly loosely placed. Yeah. I mean you can stake them in with yeah. um, willow. Yeah. And you, you create a very similar effect yeah. where you can create marsh behind it yeah. and uh, very much slow water. Yeah. yeah, so this is an example in Wales where also we've done like a bundles of uh, wood, etc., twigs, that you can force the water to go over contours, etc., following contours. But there's one important thing, like loosely packed, but you really have to stake those bundles in tightly with the soil, with, with stakes and wires. Because one, like following, because Peter Andrews was on, was on television, and lots of people started to experiment with these techniques. And one lady on her hobby farm had these big, bold, big trunks of trees on gullies to stop the water going into the gully and over the bird. And then there was a big rain and all those trunks raced through the creek and destroyed her bridge. So you have to be very careful with trunks because it, once, once the water grabs them, it's power. Yeah, Maloon Creek. Yeah, uh, Peter, but like, the, yeah, the, the, those are all the stories. Uh, it's all interacting, all connecting. But some of those inventors, they keep their own rule and it becomes a dogma. And that's why I'm very pleased with uh, permaculture because permaculture is not a dogma. It leaves field open for all the different ideas and different experiences to be building toward it. And like, like the natural secrets farming is, is, is a dogma that you're not allowed to do this, you're not allowed to do that. And of course, it's forbidden by the government to do it anyway, because you, you break the rules of the hydrology. And then of course, Colin says, pasture cropping. And like pasture cropping is the ultimate farming, the ultimate biological farming in the world. Because like you have a pasture, and then in the winter, in the autumn, you, you graze it, and then you graze it harder than like with the cell grazing. So you graze it bare, and then you sow a winter cereal in that pasture and then the winter cereal start to grow and if you persist with that for like five years seven years ten years then you get a transition of the genes in that paddock the winter annuals like the rye grass etc start to disappear and you get summer grasses summer perennial grasses that start to take over so you get this switch in different species because the summer grasses they are killed in the autumn by the frost so then the winter crop can grow and then in, no, in the spring, the summer grasses start to grow again, but bef the grain ripens before that the summer grass is like a foot tall, so you strip the grain. And then the beauty of that is that the cattle can, and the cattle and the sheep, they can graze to like an hour before you sow, and they can start grazing the paddock an hour after you finish harvest. And they can pick up all the grains and all the loose straw and all the green stuff. And of course, for any, those of you that are in animal feeding, if you have the green stuff and the straw and grain in a paddock, that's the ultimate for feeding. And of course then people say, oh, but then your, your water use efficiency for the grain, you, can, you get low grain because all the water is used by the pasture. <laughs> well, that's part of the system. In a good year, you have so much rain that the, the, the grain grows well, the winter cereal grows well. In other years, well, you have the good income from the pasture anyway, from the animals, and you don't have to worry. And his system, and I show pictures of the soil a bit later, Oh, we have to finish, uh, well, I'll finish this story. Like, I will show a picture later. Like, he now has, like, in the old, like the old, old family issues, like, his brother has the farm next door, and he had this farm, the, fam the farm was split up, etc. And he now has, and his brother does the best management practice with current farming. Best management practice current farming. But Colin has twice the stocking rate on his property with this farming. Uh, this is the picture of Colin's soil, and like you can see, luckily we have good, good lighting here. You can see here the black stuff going down like to 40, 50 centimeters, and the roots, you see roots here. This is from the neighbor, like his brother, where the roots are only up to there, and then just the solid clay, and even when you have a wet year, the roots can't follow the water because there's no uptake. And in that process, Colin sequestered over 10 years, 4.6 tons of carbon per hectare per year. 
And the stable carbon, part of it is the label carbon, like the carbon that go up in the sky as CO2 easily. The stable carbon was 3.6 tons per hectare per year. And if we then know, and that's like 13 tons of carbon dioxide equivalents per hectare per year. And if we then know that we're now talking about like $20 per ton of carbon dioxide as a carbon credit, he would get like $260 per hectare per year carbon credits on top of his profits from the farm. And because those numbers come out, the whole establishment is frightened. And they say, oh, that can't be true, can't be true. Because they, all the wood people are frightened because this is competition for money, for, for carbon sequestration. So that's why it's very difficult to convince uh, the powers in our society that this can be... Ch and then they say, ah, oh, this is just a one-off situation, can't happen. But we have now lots of situations where it does happen. Because that's in central New South Wales, like uh, ex 500 kilometers northwest of Sydney. This is uh, 200 kilometers west east of Melbourne on the south coast of New South Wales, on the south coast of Australia. This is a typical dairy farm in that country. And like a good producing dairy farm, current manager practice, you dig up the soil and like the plants have like one and a half inch roots, the rye grass, one and a half inch roots, and then the solid gray clay. Then we step over the fence to Ron and Beth's paddock. And in Ron and Beth's paddock, who are organic farming, but with biosensitivity, they have an incredibly productive system with activating the soil biology. And there we can see roots like to 50, 60 centimeters deep, and this black layer like a foot deep, all the carbon. And you, I couldn't lift a sod of the clay, all the roots, dense roots. And like he has again, twice the stocking rate of the neighbor and very healthy animals and very good systems. And all about that farm, I can tell at question time more, but then we have dinner as well. But, but like I have many stories that are incredible. Well, let me, you ask for it, I tell that story. Like, on the dairy farm, it's absolutely amazing. Like, it's, so it borders the Southern Ocean with all the cold fronts coming from the Antarctica. So when a cold front comes through, the neighbors would ring Ron up and say, oh, Ron, do you have a calf, a calf for us? Because their calves are dying in the paddock because of the cold. Ron's cows, they don't calf at that front. They just walk around there, the front is gone, they drop the calf. So this whole biological farming gets all the hormonal system of animals back in gear and they know how to protect an unborn young one. So you use holistic so, management approach? Pardon? So you use holistic management approach? Or? Yeah. 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 So with holistic management for the animal health, it's absolutely amazing what we can do. And when I'm on that farm, I think, wow, if we humans would start doing the same thing, how good would we be? This is another example like of cropping. Like this is uh, a plant sown in, a, they're, they're both like, uh, in, this in the same paddock. One half of the paddock on the left side, another half of the paddock on the other side. The left hand side was the healthy soil side of the paddock, because we split the paddock to manage one side biologically, the other side conventional, to see the difference, to show the farmer the difference in outcomes. And here we see this plant sown with like the inoculant, Incredible dense root system, and each root is colonized by the microbes. All the soil glued to the root, very dense and thick. On the right hand side is the direct drilling, like without cultivation, drill, dr direct drilling the seed. And that soil was so hard that roots can only go through some cracks in the soil. So we see those bundles of roots trying to go deeper. That's the difference between a healthy soil and a dead soil. So if you then look, yeah, and the plant size was different as well. And that's what people with, with uh, direct drilling always say, that the plants grow, because like on the left hand side, like if, if we had cultivated the, plant, cultivated the paddock, then a cultivated paddock also gives a, bit, a better seedling, because the roots have more air, they can grow better. But now we can do direct drilling without cultivation and still have a good seedling with strong roots, because we activate the biology. And this is like a paddock of Bruce and Heidi in southern New South Wales on, on the coast. And they have lots of problems with blackberries. Like here we have all the blackberries. And then here we have the lovegrass. And like lovegrass, African lovegrass, is like 
a weed, a noxious weed in Australia, because it's a slow growing uh, grass and animals don't like it that much, so we get standing hay. And it's a primitive grass. And a primitive grass grows on soils where the carbon is lower and the biology is not that active. And it, like, if you want to check in your own fields what is, what is a primitive grass and what's a higher order grass, like our, our crops like barley, wheat and oats are higher order grasses. Onion grass, barley grass, love grass, they are primitive grasses. And you can check that on your own initiative in grasses. The shorter the period from emergence to flowering, the more primitive that grass is. And those grasses, the primitive grasses, grow on unhealthy soils with low carbon and no biology. And they only emerge there. They don't emerge in a healthy soil. Because in, if, they, if those grasses emerge in a healthy soil, they are outcompeted by the rye grass. So they are shaded, they can't set seed, so they fail. So that's the intelligence of plants, of seeds. They know when to emerge. Like the primitive grasses emerge in a dead soil, in a low carbon soil, but they don't emerge in a healthy soil because they know we can't set seed, so they don't even try. Three minutes left on the battery. Yeah, we go through this. So this is, of course, cell grazing. So Bruce and Heidi started cell grazing. And in that cell grazing, so big mobs in small areas, they got rid of the love grass as a weed. Like on the left-hand side is set stock by the neighbor, like putting cattle in for five months or whatever. And they wander around and they pick and choose what they want to eat. They let the love grass stand. But with the pressured grazing of the cell grazing system, all the animals start to eat the love grass. And as the love grass doesn't get old, it becomes grazed. And the other issue that I make is, like with our so-called noxious weeds, if we apply like phosphorus fertilizer and nitrogen fertilizer to weeds, then they become less palatable because they become unbalanced and animals don't like it. So the love grass grown in a biological healthy soil becomes more palatable for the animals. Like on the left hand side, the farmer puts single superphosphate on and the love grass animals don't want it. So this is again the picture of the blueberries. So for the heavily infested blueberry, blueberry, blackberry, for the heavily infested blackberry paddock, they started to do a mob of goats. So they had a mob of goats and the, the goats were eating, like Bruce were doing observations, for every one leaf of the blackberry, they were eating two leaves of the love grass, consistently. And they, they picked all the leaves of the blackberry, so the blackberry was bare. And then this is the end of the season, and you see some love grass trampled. And then the beauty is, they use worm, they have a worm farm, so they make worm vermiculture, worm juice, and they apply like uh, five liters, seven liters per hectare worm juice in the autumn and the spring. And over a 10 year period, the pH went from 4.2 to 6.5, without any liming, just with management. So the biology made the pH go up from 4.2 to 6.5. So what happens then? Wow, medic starts to grow, clover starts to grow. Because those, those, those plants can't grow with a low pH. So through the natural sequestration, the natural succession, making the, the soil better, increasing the carbon in the soil, increasing the biological activity, they got those valuable plants back for grazing. And then also with, with the cell grazing, like this paddock had been grazed five times with cell grazing and there were no pollard, there were no tussocks growing. It was evenly grazed all the time. Because animals in a biological system, all the plants are nutritious and all the plants can be eaten by the animal. And of course the, the man manure is dug into the soil by the dung beetles. And then if you have like a modern dairy farm next door, putting like 50 kilos of urea after every grazing, then the cows come there and they put their uh, dung, their manure on a big cow pad on the paddock. And then around the cow pad you see the grass growing a foot tall very quickly. But that grass is all highly unbalanced with lots of nitrogen. So animals just walk around that, they don't want to eat that. So then that's why you get in, in conventional farms, you get all these tussocks and paddocks around cow pads because it's all nitrogen dominant and animals don't like nitrogen if they have the choice.